Um, so we are joined by Dr. Sarah Marshall uh, this evening uh, to provide our talk on global health. Um, there will be some time for Q&A um, after the lecture. So if you do have any questions as we're going along, you can just pop them into the Q&A function on Zoom um, and we'll try and get through as many of those as possible um, this evening. Um, it's often not possible to get through everybody's questions, but we'll try to, to get through as many of those as we can. Lovely. In which case, um, I will introduce our, our speaker this evening. Uh, so Dr. Sarah Marshall is an honorary lecturer uh, in global health, having recently retired from the global health and infection department at BSMS. Um, Sarah is a qualified pharmacist and her PhD looked to find new medicines to treat malaria based on plant remedies uh, being used in West Africa. Um, and Sarah has worked in Oman and the Netherlands, as well as the UK, in various pharmacy settings, including community and hospital pharmacy, as well as at universities and in clinical trends. Uh, trials even. So uh, at that point, I will hand over uh, to Sarah uh, for, for tonight's lecture. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for invite inviting me to be part of this. And I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about global health, um, which is an, um, an area that I've actually fallen into, but I'm absolutely very passionate about. And as, as Zach said, I started off my journey um, because I started off doing a PhD, having done a pharmacy degree, looking at whether we could get, ac get medicines to treat malaria from traditional remedies, plant remedies that were being used in West Africa. So, um, Zach, I wondered if you'd start off with a Mentimeter, because I, I can't see anybody, so I'm speaking blind today. But I just wondered whether you could actually give me an indication of where you're joining us from today. I know that in the past we've had people from Trinidad and Tobago and from Nigeria and from Hong Kong, as well as from the UK. So we would love to know where you're, where you're joining us from. So what I'd like you to do is go to the Mentimeter link that's at the top, and you can see there's a code here, and we'll use this for a couple of questions. Thank you very much indeed. It looks like, Zach, we've, um, that's the number of responses that we've got. We've not got any more. So, yes, thank you. But the other thing I'd be really interested to know is what subject would you like to study at university? That's really helpful for me to know. So we've particularly got an emphasis on healthcare professionals and healthcare sciences and things like that. So as, as Zach said, I'm Dr. Sarah Marshall. I've got my undergraduate degree in pharmacy. I've just finished, um, I've just retired as a lecturer in global health, which is why they've given me the title of honorary lecturer, because I'm going to still carry on doing some bits and pieces. And I'm based at the Brighton and Sussex Centre for Global Health Research, which is part of the medical school. So what I'm going to be talking to you about today, I'm going to do a little bit of myth busting, okay? And you'll, we'll understand a little bit more about that later. We're going to talk about measuring global health. We're going to talk a little bit about social determinants of health, which for those of you, if you've, any of you are doing um, an A-level in sociology or have done a GCSE in, G, in, in sociology, you all know a little bit about that. But for some of us, that's new territory. And then finally, we're going to have a look at a case study in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then I'll talk a little bit about medicines as part of that. Right, okay, time for some myth busting. I'm going to explain some global health terms. What I'd like you to do is to put some answers into the chat. What do we mean by health? Oh, this is looking good. Thank you very much. Most of you are opting for physical and mental well-being. Um, physical and mental well-being, free from disease, Asia. Thank you very much. Oh, this is interesting. Provocative, Mohammed. The holistic welfare of society. Zainab said well-being. State of physical and well state from open. Social, mental, physical state of well-being, Saul. Thank you very much for that. Physical and mental well-being physical, social, and mental well-being. Great. Okay. Physical, social, and emotional well-being. Okay. So there's some really interesting messages coming up here. So that most of you are opting for physical, mental, and social well-being. Great. Thank you. And some of you are opting for not being mentally or physically ill or without illness or injury. State of being free from disease. Yep. There's all sorts of aspects. 
Okay, right. If you'd like to, st we'll stop with that now because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. Because you're getting the right, the right idea. Because. Yes, you're right. It is in one part, it's about the absence of disease or injury or infirmity. But it's also what some of you have picked up, which is brilliant, is that it's much broader than that. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. And some of you picked that out, which is excellent. And not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. And that's how the World Health Organization defines health. So I'm going to talk to you about global health. What do we mean by global health? I'm not going to get you to put anything in the chat this time round. A lot of people think that it's actually about health worldwide, health all around the globe. But actually with global health, there's a, a particular focus. There's an emphasis on what we call health inequities. And by inequities, I mean the avoidable and unfair differences in health globally. And that can happen. There can be differences between countries. There can be differences within countries. There can also be differences within age groups within a country. There can also be differences within cities. So I'm based in Brighton and some of us are actually based in Brighton. Some of the people on the call are based in Brighton. And there are huge differences um, in health outcomes just within our city. OK, this is the first one of the first myths I want to bust. Quite often you're going to hear, and I get very cross about it, the term developing country. And you'll hear it on the television, you'll hear it on the radio, you'll see it written in papers. And I want you to, next time you say, next time you hear that, I want you to query it and say, why are you using that phrase? So that's your job. OK, so these are some of the reasons. Developing country is hugely contentious in global health terms. But these are some of the reasons why it's not appropriate. Because it's actually judgmental. It's quite often been used from somebody from a high income setting, a developed setting about another setting and about developing. And it's suggested of inferiority. It also suggests that developed countries have finished developing. So, you know, we've actually achieved everything. We don't need to get any further. But for those of us that are based in the UK, for example, we know of the difficulties that the NHS, for example, faces at the moment. There's no way that we have finished developing. We have got so many more improvements in people's health that we can make. Also, are countries with a space program Developing? Can you class them as developing? So this photograph is a picture from India's space program. And India is often referred to as a, a developing country, but they have a space program with $74 million spent, was spent on sending a probe to the moon. That's not developing to me. And lastly, I'm going to give you, these are, these are some of the reasons why we shouldn't use the phrase developing country. Lastly, I'm going to give a statistical reason. So if you have a look at this graph with me, what it shows is on the, the vertical axis, life expectancy in years. And on the horizontal income, um, axis, it's income per person. And each one of those little bubbles represents a country. And the bigger the country, the bigger the, the population of the country, the bigger the bubble. And this is from data from 2018. And you can see that the colors correspond to um, different parts of the world. So the green bubbles are for North America and South America. The blue ones are for um, the African continent. And the yellow ones are for um, Europe. And the red ones are for the Middle East and Asia. OK, so what we can see is if we plot for those countries, 
the income per person for each country versus the average life expectancy for men and women, what we can see is we get a range of values. Okay, so, um, and this is a logarithmic scale. So the phrase developing country actually came about in the 1950s and 60s when there was a really clear distinction between countries that had low income and low life expectancy. So they were all down in the bottom right hand, bottom, well, left hand corner compared with high income countries with high income uh, per person. So they were all in the top right hand corner. And there was a really clear divide between developing and developed. That's no longer the case. So because actually there are countries on a scale, a spectrum of development, if you like. OK, so it's no longer the case. It's a clear separation. What we tend to use instead is the term resource poor settings or low, middle and high income countries or emerging economies, um, particularly low, middle and high income countries, a particularly useful phrase um, because it's much less um, judgmental and much more objective. So the next time you hear that phrase, developing country, pick somebody up on it. So I'm gonna to talk to you about global health. Well, let's think about how we can measure health, first of all. How can we measure how healthy the population of a country is? Oh, this is good and good. An idea of how healthy the population. Um, somebody suggests looking at life expectancy. Yes, all oh, this is brilliant. Obesity rates. Okay, GDP. All oh, good stuff. Um, people per doctor, life expectancy, health records, HDI. Okay, health development. Okay, quality of life survey. Um, cause of death. Yep, quality of life, life expectancy, mortality rates. Good. And life expectancy, qualies, prevalence and incidences. Oh, right, you've been reading my notes. By seeing a person's calorie intake, that's a really interesting one. Um, quality of life and so on. We've got some really, okay, infant mortality rates. So, no, look, good, well done. Looking at the age demographic, oh, employment, good. Right, you're obviously thinking broadly, some of you, that's really super. Okay, maternity rates, so maternity, maternal mortality. Okay, birth rates, healthcare services, looking at diseases that are common in the country or potential illnesses and their healthcare practices and medical equipment. Right, you've really, you're doing really well here. This is fabulous. Um, I'd love it when you talk to me. Thank you very much. Different disease rates. Thank you. Looking at mental health. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, right. Malnutrition and extensive immunization. There's some fabulous ideas in there. I'm just going to talk about some of the metrics that some of you have mentioned. Life expectancy. Brilliant. You, most of you got that. Well, many of you mentioned that. Life expectancy at birth. Incidents, some of you met, mentioned, with an incidence being the number of new cases of a disease or condition and prevalence being the total number of existing cases. So, OK, the incidence of COVID, um, the number of new cases today compared with the prevalence, which is the number of total people who've got COVID at the, nice, at the, at the time, whether that's in the last three weeks or two weeks or so, and have still got it. Um, mortality, and some of you can pick picked out that can be cause related, so related to a particular type of illness or, or, or cause, injury, for example. It can also be age related, so looking, for, for example, at children, or it can be related to, to sex. So it could be, could be um, for example, sex specific, so maternal, looking at um, maternal mortality. So some of the things that we would use to measure that are neonatal mortality rates. So that's children under the age of 28 days. Infant mortality rates, so that's children under the age of one year. Or child mortality, being under five years. And then you've got the maternal mortality ratio, which is the number of women that die as a result of pregnancy or childbirth compared to the total number of women giving birth. And then we've also got, because not every disease and condition that we're interested in will cause deaths, then um, we've actually want to get a measure for diseases that 
cause suffering but don't cause death. So, for example, um, something like rheumatoid arthritis causes a great deal of suffering and pain, but it doesn't kill people instantly and that sort of thing. So we need a measure for, for that. Um, and that's years lived with an impairment or years lived with disability. And that can be, it's not just, for example, a lost limb, but actually any condition that causes an impairment, whether that's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or, um, or as I say, um, a number of different conditions, rheumatoid arthritis. Let's have a look at life expectancy. And I'm going to look at life expectancy at birth here because it can vary hugely between regions. And by life expectancy, the definition of that, of that is the average number of additional years a newborn baby can be expected to live if current mortality trends were to continue for the rest of that person's life. Okay, so a baby is born today and their life expectancy is estimated based on assuming that nothing changes in the circumstances around in their society and so on um, in the in the foreseeable future. If we look at this data for life expectancy from 2019, the different colours relate to the different life expectancy in the different countries. So the darkest areas are life expectancy are between 86 and 90 years. So we can see Canada, parts of Europe and Australia. And gradually, as they get paler, life expectancy is going down. So you can see at the bottom end, we've got life expectancy of 54 years for some parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So we can see that there's a big difference in life expectancy in different regions. And we can see that in general, countries in sub-Saharan Africa have the lowest life expectancy. So some of us may be familiar with that. What might be less familiar to us is that actually if we look at high income countries, life expectancy can also vary. Let's have a look at these seven G7 countries. This shows life expectancy at birth for the years 2021 or the latest available, mostly that's 2021. So on the right hand side, we've got this vertical column and that gives us the number of years that people are expected to live. And on the bottom, we've got the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, Canada, France, Italy, Japan, all rich, high income countries. But what we can see is that actually life expectancy varies hugely within these all of these very rich countries. So, for example, we tend to think of us as being, ourselves as being quite similar to the U.S., but actually, the U.S. Um, life expectancy for 2021 was 77 years, whereas in the U.K., 80.4 years, three-year difference for quite similar societies. But actually, if we start to drill down, and I know some of you are in, are in the U.K. and some of you are in England, um, even within countries, life expectancy can vary. So on the um, left-hand side of your slides, we've got life expectancy for boys or males at birth, 2016 to 2018. And here you can see in the center, you can see the scale. So the palest green is below 76 years and the darkest blue is 88, up to between 85 and 88 years. So we can see that depending on where you live in England, life expectancy for males at birth is different. And then we start to drill down further. This map that you see on the right hand side is actually the area where I am now, which is Brighton and Sussex. And there's actually a huge difference even within this region of, of two, three years, three years, yeah, between the city and some of the, the, the less urban areas. So there's a huge amount of variation between in, in life expectancy just within a city, within a country and within a region. So the question is, why is this happening? Is it because people are different? I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what we call social determinants of health. 
What determines whether people are healthy or not? I wonder if you can give me some quick answers in the chat. Okay, we've got poverty, lifestyle, income, access to proper nutrition, diet, environmental quality, upbringing, access to healthcare, brilliant, disease. Okay, you're really on upbringing, interesting symptoms, um, illness. Um, great ideas here, folks. Thank you. Safe housing, diet, diet. Okay. What else have we got? I think is that education. Yes, education is always a good answer. Um, lifestyle, mental stability, depending on income. Thank you, Mara, and where people live. Genetics. Yeah, absolutely. Financial situation. OK, income, access to health care, parents, genetics, epigenetics, happiness. That's a good one to pick on. Thank you, Joe. Um, well-being, past medical history, crime, crime rates. Yeah, genetics, genetics sometimes. Yeah, nutrition, income, air quality, health care, culture, environmental changes, diet, BMI. Right. This is super physical activity less, levels, weight. Great. OK. Access to certain things. Oh, that's interesting. Um, um, con being content with life. Okay. Um, sports or active life, diet and social life, access to charity services, practically everything, right? That's a good one, Sile Soul. Thank you. Um, quality of life compared to the rest of society, social setting, living standards, council funding, health luxuries, for example, gyms. Oh, this is really good discussion stuff. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for that. There are, you've picked out some really good examples. And I think you've probably picked out most of the things that I'm going to talk about. As we said, genetics, also age can determine, determines the sorts of conditions that we will get at particular ages. So children will get chickenpox, whereas older people might get Parkinson's or degenerative conditions. Sex will determine which sort of, uh, which sort of conditions that we get. Some, some cancers, for example, are linked to either male or female sex. Genetics, as you've all picked out. Individual lifestyle factors. Some of you were talking about diet and nutrition. Anybody mention smoking or alcohol? Not sure. Do people, you do, talked about exercise, certainly. But yes, drug use, for example, as in illegal drug use. These can affect us, our people's health. Social and community networks. We didn't actually, we talked about, perhaps wasn't, we didn't really pick that out so much in the chat. But what we've seen through COVID, for example, when people were in lockdown and people were in isolation, is that actually we are... Um, designed to be part of a network as human beings. Um, so we are social and community networks are actually vital for both mental health, but also our physical health. Water and sanitation is really important. If we've got poor water and sanitation, you're much more likely to get diarrheal diseases. Socioeconomic status you picked up on. Air pollution, I think somebody did mention air pollution. If, you, if you're burning, for example, and we're talking globally here because we're talking about global health. If you're, if you're burning things like peat or animal dung to provide heat to cook with, for example, or to heat your home, then you're gonna get particulates in the air. And that means that you're much more likely to get chest infections and things like that. A work environment. So if you're doing a job which is quite risky and is, isn't very well protected by safety standards, then you're, that's going to affect your health. For example, if you're mining or you're logging or you're mining gold, for example, in poor quality conditions. Yeah. Or, or mining coal, for example. Education you picked out. Thank you for that. Education is one of the most important things we can do to improve her people's health. Agriculture and food production, linking to some of you mentioned about diet and, and nutrition. If in a country all of your land is being used to grow tobacco, for example, or much of your land is being used to grow tobacco, then when a drought hits, then you have much less um, capacity to provide food for your, for your country. We call that food security. Gender norms and equity. Now, I don't think we picked up on this. Um, so 
the idea of the roles, gender roles and how fair they are and whether people are one gender is, is more disadvantaged than another, for example. And we'll look at a little bit of an example of that later on. That can really affect people's health. Housing, we talked about. If you're living in a in a house with uh, that's damp and that's cold and there are lots of you all, all in, in one room, that can really be very detrimental to health, for example, for tuberculosis or for infectious diseases. Healthcare services, whether they're there and if you can get to them. Good, you picked up on that, some of you. Employment versus unemployment. Mostly it's, it's thought that um, employment is better than unemployment for health, but it depends what it is. It depends on how stressful it is and um, whether you have any, what we call agency, to actually, uh, to be allowed to, to, to make decisions about your, within your employment. And then overarching all of that, we've got national, regional and international politics. So WHO, and those are the, what we call social determinants, and the World Health Organization defines social determinants as social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. Social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities, the unfair and avoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries. And quite often you'll see this depicted as a, a rainbow sort of onion type model with lots of layers to it. And this is Dahlgren and Whitehead's model. And you've got the things that we talked about, you can see them in, in successive layers. So age, sex and genetics, individual lifestyle factors, social and community networks. And then beyond that, living and working conditions. And then beyond that, general socioeconomic, cultural and environmental conditions. And I'll show you a little bit more about how that works when we look at our case study later. But what this doesn't show, what this diagram doesn't capture, capture is the interactions between all of these and the fact that actually it's a very dynamic process. This suggests that it's static, but actually it's extremely dynamic. And we can see that social determinants affect health when we look at the example of TB in the UK. When we think about what's led to successful TB control in the UK, let's have a look at this graph. And on the bottom, this shows um, the notification rates and the death rates from TB per 100,000 people from the years 1913 to 2009. So almost a century. So we've got 2000, it starts with 1913 on the horizontal axis and finishes at 2009. And then on the, the vertical axis on the left-hand side, we've got the notification rate per 100,000 people. So this is the number of cases of tuberculosis that have been notified to the, to the authorities. And that's the red line. The green line is the death rate per 100,000 people. So this one is the one that starts here. So that's the number of deaths per, per, for tuberculosis. And then what we can see is that actually the number of cases and the number of deaths from tuberculosis was decreasing substantially before we introduced what we call chemotherapy, which is basically using medicines to treat TB. And before we had um, a vaccine, BCG, against TB, and before we started to pasteurize milk to prevent TB being contract contracted from cattle. And before the, in, in, um, the uh, advent of short course therapy. So what was happening? Before all these medicines and these vaccines and these interventions came along, TB was already, already decreasing. What was actually happening was that housing was improving and there was less poverty. So when I said about, about housing and being very tightly closed, um, lots of people living in one house. That's um, 
a huge factor on in TB rates. And so housing improved and poverty improved. People, people didn't live in poverty so much or people were, were moving out of poverty. And those social determinants were improving TB. Let's have a look at how this works in um, practice. And I'm going to compare two countries. I'm going to compare Afghanistan and the United Kingdom. And I'm going to look at some of the metrics that we've talked about that we can use to measure health. So if we look at life expectancy at birth in years for Afghanistan, about 60 and about 81 years. This, these da this data is from about 2015, but it hasn't changed a great deal since. If we look at the under five mortality rate for the two countries, and the, by that we mean the number of deaths of children under five years per thousand live births. In the UK, it's about five. When Afghanistan, it's 20 fold higher. So that's almost one in 10 children not reaching their fifth birthday. If we look at the maternal mortality ratio, which is, as I've said before, the number of women who die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth complications per 100,000 live births in a given year. So 100,000 babies being born. In the UK, it's estimated to be about eight women who die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. Whereas in Afghanistan, it's um, 400, which is huge. It's one of the worst in the world. Let's think about some of the social determinants that we see. Um, with Afghanistan's been in the news a great deal recently. Um, we have conflict, we have extreme poverty, we have a lack of education, and you will have seen um, girls who, are, who have not been allowed to go to secondary school being hugely brave and protesting about that and then that's been in the about their lack of, of, of education that that is um that they are allowed to have um malnutrition is quite severe so people just not getting enough um nutrients weak healthcare systems so a health system that's not working very well and then gender inequity so an unfair difference in how the genders are treated um, whereas the UK, for example, lifestyle, an aging population and a strong health system um, have actually caused or actually are responsible for some, for some of those um, differences in metrics. OK, so is everybody with me so far? Yeah. OK. Now, we talked a little bit about um, child mortality, so under five mortality. And that is, it's good to know what children, are, this, it's a good metric to have to know how many children are dying, but actually it can tell us so much more than that. Let's have a look at the global distribution of deaths um, for children in the ages 20, uh, for, for 20, figures from 2017. So we look, what we're looking at is this sort of ring which shows what children are dying from, children under five globally. So if we look on the left hand, so you can see there's a blue line that's almost, almost half. Most, almost half of the deaths, so we're looking at about 45%, are actually in neonates, so in children under 28 days. And the rest are in children between the ages of 28 days and five years. And what we can start to see are the things that are causing children to die. There's lots of different things, which I won't go into any detail, but have a look with me at the top right hand side. You can see that big blue chunk, that dark blue chunk. That's acute respiratory infections. So that's things like pneumonia. And then there's another chunk next to it, a dark pink chunk of diarrheal diseases. So when we've got lots of children dying from pneumonia and from diarrheal diseases, that actually shows us something about the country. It shows us that actually there's a, um, a high rate of air pollution. It shows us that the causes of these things 
are actually um, are, are causing a lot of problems. It's diarrheal diseases we've talked about, water and sanitation. Um, if it's poor, then that can really contribute to diarrheal diseases being high. And um, if you, for example, if there's a high incidence of meningitis or measles, then that suggests that there's a problem with the healthcare service because children can be vaccinated against meningitis and measles. And Melinda Gates has put it like this, um, child mortality is a proxy for overall well-being, but it's also a leading indicator of progress or a lack of it. So these metrics, these measurements that we can use can show us not just the number of children or people who've got a particular condition or children that are dying, but actually can actually show, reveal a great deal more about a country. So let's actually have a look at the top 10 causes of death, comparing high income countries, HIC, and low and middle income countries. And that's between 1990 and 2013. If we look at the high income countries, which is the two charts at the top, we can see the blue ones are what we call non-communicable diseases. The red pinkish lines are communicable, so infections, but also maternal causes, neonatal and nutritional diseases. And then the green ones are injuries, so things like road injuries and self-harm. So if we look at high income countries and compare 1990 to 2013, they've actually, the causes of death haven't changed a great deal. They're very similar. They're predominantly these non-communicable, these blue ones, these non-communicable diseases. Whereas in low and middle income countries, what we've seen is um, an epidemiological transition, but you don't need to worry about that. But an epidemiological transition, we've seen a change in the pattern of disease, things that are causing people to, to die. Um, so in 1990, in low and middle income countries, we had um, predominantly these red conditions, and communicable, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional. And now in 2013, we're moving to actually the top three causes of death are non-communicable diseases. But there are still communicable diseases so pneumonia, HIV and tuberculosis are still causing a significant number of deaths. If we just compare high income countries in 2013 with low income or low and middle income countries, we can see that there's actually a significant difference. And why is that? It's back to our social determinants of health and this, this model that I showed you, Dahlgren and Whitehead's model. So although many of us are interested in healthcare and health professions and biomedical um, and neuroscience and things like this, actually, the, if we're going to improve health globally, it's going to need a much broader approach. It's going to need a multidisciplinary approach, because if we're saying that these are the things that affect health, then have a look at those and think, what sort of people need to be involved to actually improve these things, these factors. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about the Democratic Republic of Congo, which if you look at the map on the right hand side, I can get my mouse to go there. Yes, DRC, right in the heart of sub-Saharan Africa. The capital is Kinshasa. Um, the population is about 87.7 million people, and it's a low income country. The fertility rate is about 4.7 births per woman. So that means that women are having um, an average of four or five children during their lifetime. The life expectancy, male to female, for men, it was about 60.4 years, and for women, it was 64.3 years. The under five mortality rate was 57, it's 57 per thousand live births. So not as high as in Afghanistan, but still very high. And the things that cause people to die, we see this chart in the middle here. Number one, 
malaria, two, tuberculosis, three, pneumonia, lower respiratory infections, four, neonatal disorders, so things that are killing babies, um, and five, diarrheal disease. Yep, malaria is my, as I say, is my research project, is my research area. Um, nobody needs to die of malaria, not anymore. We've had a cure for 400 years. Um, civil registration of birds is 28%. And what I mean by that is that actually only 28% of, of babies born, their birds are reported to the authorities and registered. So that means you can get a birth certificate and you can enroll for school and all of this sort of thing. Only about 28% of children are being registered. DRC is a country that's recovering from conflict um, from, uh, in 19, between 1994 and 2003, but there are still rebel groups operating. And it's rich in diamonds, gold, copper, zinc, and coltan, which is a, um, a component of mobile phones, so it's, it's very much sought after. And when we try and think about the social determinants of health that are operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we have poverty. As I said, it's a low income setting. We have conflict and the aftermath of conflict because you don't, if, a con if you've had a conflict or war, you don't just suddenly everything improve. It, it, it wrecks health infrastructure and societies and cohesiveness. But as a conflict, as a result of the conflict, we have people who are displaced, and that can mean that they are displaced within their country because there's conflict in the one area, so they've had to move to another area and leave everything behind them. Or it could be that they've actually had to move to a different country and have become refugees. Got poor quality roads and transport. We've also got um, Ebola outbreaks that occur regularly. For those of you who will be familiar with Ebola, with the viral condition that's passed on by touch and is fatal in many, many instances. The health service is really struggling um, as a result of the conflict, but also the lack of investment and the lack of, and the lack of money available if, for a low income country. 53% of girls aged 5 to 17 don't go to school at all. We're talking about education here as a social determinant. Also attacks on health workers. I talked about rebel groups still operating. So for example, the charity um, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, they've, had, they've had to pull out of, of DRC at times because of attacks on their workers, but also attacks on, on um, DRC health workers. 42% of the population lives in urban areas. Now, why is that significant? It means that 58% is living in rural areas. And there, there tends to be that urban areas are where facilities are and health services are predominantly. So that means that 58% are going to have a reduced access to health care. And then lastly, as I've referred to, there's this gender inequity, this uneven um, balance in what one gender is compared to, is, is able to do particularly amongst for, for girls versus boys. So look at this diagram and look at these social determinants. And I wondered if you'd like to give me some ideas about jobs that are needed to improve health in DRC. I'll pop them in the chat. Social workers, thank you, Lowry. Okay. Midwives, policy makers, educators, brilliant, love it. Construction workers, Charlotte, thank you. Teachers, yes, thank you. Doctors, builders, yes, Joe, thank you. Teachers and professors, I like that one, thank you very much. Did I see investors? Ahmed, that's superb, well done, thank you. Yeah, people who are actually better politicians, Humza, thank you. Social workers, occupational therapists, community workers, mental health workers. Yes, absolutely. Police. Well done. That's superb. Shan Shanchita. Um, community nurses, teachers, doctors. Yes. Um, key workers, nurses, doctors, nurses, 
Charity, thank you, Sanchita, for the pharmacist mention. Charity workers, yeah. Construction activists, love it, Grace, thank you. Researchers, non-corrupt politicians, human rights activists, teachers, a leader, a politician to unite, unite the country and make efficient policies. Farmers, Nidhi, thank you, that's brilliant. Um, a stable government, lawyers, awareness spreaders, if that's a job. Yes, active, we could call it uh, uh, um, activism, thank you. Humanitarian aid workers, journalists to raise global awareness. Um, technologies, yes, technologists, businessmen and women, musicians, Saul, love it, musicians to cheer people up. Yes, absolutely. These are super, thank you. Practically everything once again. Yes, human rights lawyers. Yes, lawyers. Food scientists, farmers. Superb. Well done. Okay, you've got the hang of this. You understand. It's not just because as, as healthcare professionals, myself as a pharmacist, and, and some of us are thinking of going into healthcare and nursing and midwifery and docs and medicine and so on. The good news is, the bad news is that it's not just up to us, but the good news is it's not just up to us because this is an, a multidisciplinary effort. Yeah. Have a look at this diagram with me. This is MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières. It's there what they call their chain of life. So um, they are a charity trying to get vaccines to the Democratic Republic of Congo, to children in remote parts of Democratic Republic Congo. And you, you, as you saw with all of those things that we highlighted, there are lots of difficulties that have to be overcome to do that really well. So the vaccines start off, you look at the very top, they start off in Belgium or in, in, or in France, and then they have to be transported by truck, and then they have to be transported by plane to Kinshasa. And then once they get to Kinshasa, to the capital of DRC, they have to be, um, they, they, the plane lands and they go through customs. Okay, and then they will have to be transported perhaps 4,000 miles um, through along, along the roads, which may be quite um, poor, in poor, quite, quite poor condition. And so eventually, if the roads get very poor condition, then actually they'll be transported by motorbike in specially adopted, adapted cool boxes to keep vaccines cold because as you know vaccines have to be kept many vaccines have to be kept between two and eight degrees so eventually they're coming by motorbike but in the meantime um, health promoters have been out busy telling people in the communities of these villages about the importance of vaccination this is for measles for example so that everybody is sensitized before um, and actually wants to come and get uh, get a vaccine before um, it actually arrives. So this is to say MSF's chain of life is zigzag to make sure that people get the medicines that they need and children get the vaccinations that they need. So we've thought about generally what sort of jobs are needed for people to improve global health. But let's think specifically about this one, about trying to get vaccines to people safely securely and, and, and properly. What sort of jobs do you think might be needed for that one? I'm gonna have a look at the chat. Pilots, engineers, yes, yes, absolutely. Community nurses, drivers, logistics experts. Thank you, Holly. Yes, people who know how to organize the supply chain so that actually things are end up in the right place at the right temperature at the right term. Drivers, truck drivers, yeah. Absolutely. Truck drivers, managers. Yes, Ahmed, thank you very much. Translators. Thank you, Eleanor. Non-government organization workers. Pharmacists. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and drivers. Nurses. Yep. Truck drivers. Midwives. Yep. Public health campaigners. Yes. Fundraisers. Absolutely. Local coordinators, drivers, community workers, logisticians, logisticians pharmacists, health promoters in the community and local people getting involved. Yes, absolutely, to make sure that this is um, something that's not top-down driven, but as actually it comes up from the grassroots as well. Um, armed forces, right, okay. Um, employing local people, people who inform. Yes, people who are gonna give a uh, raise awareness. Um, 
manufacturers, yeah, absolutely. Healthcare workers to administer the vaccines. Public speakers, that's a really good idea, Gerline, because you want people who can actually, um, yeah, and so this is picking up by Saul as well. You want people who can talk about this, who can raise awareness of what's needed so that people can get funding. Volunteers to promote vaccines in the community, people from, from other countries with helping with funding, high incomes, volunteers to inject vaccines, doctors to train the local peoples, reporters possibly to raise awareness. This is fab. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, great. You've got some fabulous ideas. I came up with some. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, logisticians, interpreters. We had mechanics, make sure that the trucks still work, um, drivers, pilots, inventors, engineers, filmmakers, because to, to actually, as we say, to raise awareness, social scientists to understand why people think particular ways and psychologists to help influence behavior, um, marketing people, um, graphic designers to, to produce all these nice infographics that can communicate a message really well, design technologists, so looking at design of, um, of cold boxes, for example, or lawyers, managers and administrators, human resources staff and warehouse staff. So there are lots of different ways that lots of different professions and lots of different jobs and people that are needed to actually make this work really well. So that's my last slide. Um, so to conclude, there are many different measurements used to measure global health. We talked about life expectancy and mortality of various age groups and things. Um, but these in measurements can actually give insights into social determinants of health. And we can't improve global health with medicines and with, with just with, with healthcare professionals unless we improve the social determinants. And improving global health, it's going to need a multidisciplinary approach. So everybody needs to get involved. Now, Zach, I've run over time a little bit. But I was going to say, does anybody does anybody have any questions? Have you got lots of questions in the Q&A? We haven't had that many come through. We can try okay, and answer a few. Uh, yep, just we are sure. we are close on time today. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. But that's great. We've had, no, no, it's been an excellent, excellent level of interaction as well from you've from been everybody, superb. Thank um, you, everybody who's been here. So this it's been fabulous. Um, so we'll try and answer a couple of questions here um, that have that have come in. If you get a couple of questions in now, that we might be able to answer some of those. Um, so the first one that we've got here that that came in fairly early um and i think this was when you were talking about um the terms developing and developed countries i could i can read it actually yeah uh, Thank yes you. so it's quite a tricky one this um, but Ooh. i'll read it out in case anybody else can uh, can see it uh, can't see it thank you for your insightful criticisms on the use of the terms developing and developed and um, what are your thoughts about referring to countries as previous colonial powers or previously colonized nations i find that it is helpful to analyze how colonialism has led to global health disparities but i'm interested to hear the criticisms of the use of these terms too any thoughts about that Sarah? Oh. No, it's, it's a very loaded question in a, um, in a nutshell elena thank you very much um i i can see both sides to this because uh, because there is a huge impact that colonialism has had on people's history. But you, do you want to define countries by their past all the time? So, um, yes, I'm going to leave that one for you to think about, because I would I think I think there are it's, it's hugely loaded. And I'm going to back away from that one and actually say that there are probably advantages and disadvantages. Um, somebody who was anonymous, how the new malaria vaccine works. OK, a little bit about about that. Malaria is quite a difficult disease to um, develop a vaccine to because I don't know if you know much about it, but the parasite, when somebody is bitten by the mosquito and the parasite enters the blood, um, it actually goes and hides in the liver and then in red blood cells. So it's actually quite hard to for the immune system in the body to actually find it. So um, what the malaria, the new malaria vaccine does and has, has been targeted at is um, antigens on the, 
the very the first the form of the parasite that is first injected. So as soon as it gets into the body, it's the pro pro proteins on the outside of the of the um, uh, the sporozoite, the swimming version of the parasite, before it goes and hides in the liver or in the blood blood cells. So that's the way that it can re re um, actually triggers an immune reaction. Ooh. This is a potentially a really good one to, to make sure that we include here. Um, how can we start a career in global health? Right. Um, well, as you've seen, everybody can actually be involved in improving global health. We need a multidisciplinary effect, um, a, a effort. It depends on what you're interested in doing um, because Oh, there's loads of questions. I'm not going to have a big, a, 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 a lot okay. of time to answer all of these. Um, sorry, just think about where we're going. Yeah, starting a career in global health. I would say get your qualifications first, but also look at um, um, operations, uh, examples of um, or organizations that you can get involved in if, as a student. If I'm, if I'm presuming that you're thinking about university, then um, there's organizations such as um, Students for Global Health. You can get involved with that one. That's, um, you'll find branches at most universities. Um, that's for um, medics, but pharmacists, but actually anybody that's interested in global health. They organize conferences. If you are interested, if you are doing um, medicine, for example, there are organizations that you can join as a medic. There are organizations that you can join as a pharmacist, for example, as a pharmacy student. We, we have the International Pharmacy Students Federation, which is part of our global um, professional body, the FIP. Um, it, so you can join them and they do conferences all around the world and get pharmacy students to actually go out and do um, health promotion campaigns wherever they are, whether it's Indonesia or Ghana and so on and so on. What I will do is just share very briefly some information about some other bits and pieces that you might be interested in. Um, our, our next monthly lecture, like I said, we run this every month, um, is on Wednesday, the 7th of December. Um, this is uh, led by Dr. Simon Mitchell, who uh, is a systems biologist. So looking at sort of virtual patients and uh, using virtual patients to choose um, sort of the right medication. Um, so that's that looks to be a really interesting one as well. Um, we also have a number of other talks um, and online activities that you can join um, if you want to find out more about medicine in general. Like I said, if you do have any questions that come out of today's um, talk, um, we unfortunately, we, we aren't able to answer um, all of those. Um, please do um, send us an email to outreach at bsms.ac.uk. Um, you can also find us on social media at BSMS Outreach um, if you do want to ask ask us any more questions, find out any more about what um, we have coming up in terms of other activities. Um, excellent. Any, anything that you would like to close with, um, Sarah? I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everybody. And uh, um, because thank you very much indeed for your involvement with the chat and for being willing to answer questions. And I would like to just wish you all the best with your careers and with your university and everything. Um, and it's lovely to see just how enthusiastic you are and how engaged and how um, and how interested. And thank you for the very kind comments that are put in the, put in the chat as well. I'm glad it's been helpful. Excellent. I'd thank like you. to yeah, echo those remarks in the in the in the comments. Thank you very much for, for your lecture this evening. Um, Sarah, it's been really, really, really interesting. So um, thank you very much. Pleasure. And thank you for attending, folks. Um, you can now head off, enjoy the rest of your evenings, um, and hopefully we'll see you at another lecture in the very near future.